Good afternoon, this is Connie Lester. Uh, it is November the 4th, 2020. We are conducting this oral history via Zoom due to the COVID-19 pandi pandemic. With me today are Kendra Medina, Bradley Paul, Joshua Henderson, Robert Cribb, and Dalton Rosenfeld. We are conducting this interview with Walter Hawkins. And good afternoon to everyone. I'm delighted to be with you all. Kendra, do you want to ask the first question? So our first question today is, what is your current position? What do you do and how did you get there? Well, that's a great question to ask, and thank you for asking that. Uh, again, my name is Walter Hawkins, and my title presently is Director of Urban Development for the Downtown Development Board and our Community Redevelopment Agency. We always make it short and say Downtown Development Board and the CRA. I have been with the City of Orlando since 1992, and I started in the capacity working with uh, Mayor Glenda E. Hood and serving in the role as Director of Constituent Services. Can I, and stop, that, can I stop us? I'm getting a red light on the recording and that's not okay. what I want. Can we start <laughs> over again? Okay. But wait just a minute and let me, let me try this again. And it came over when I spoke. I can see I'm lit, you know, it's, Led on my side. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and assume that this is that this is recording. But <laughs> I'm not liking the way it looks. So, yeah. you, let let me of, start again. Pardon? Do you, do you want one of us to also record it so you have like a backup just in case? That's a good idea. Thank you. Would you also record it? Thank you. <laughs> that one. has the option. Uh, oh, no, it says it's already recording at the top left. So maybe I have a okay. recording software on my computer. Give me a second. Robert, you might get an A out of this class for coming up with that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this, I think this is a recorder. I don't know if it's a screen recorder or a. <clears throat> Order, so I'll just hit it now. Okay, well, go ahead and try it, and we'll we'll see yeah. what happens. Okay. It says it's recording, so it's, yeah, it's on my side. It says recording. Yeah, I'll I'll see if this. Okay. On my side, it does computer. too, but it has a red light on it, so that's what has me worried. Okay. All right, so let's start over, Walter, if you'll speak, so I can we can start again. Okay. Well, good afternoon. This is Walter Hawkins with the Downtown Development Board and CRA. Does that work? This is, yes, this is Connie Lester. It is November the 4th, 20, 2020. Uh, with me are Kendra Medina, Bradley Paul, Joshua Henderson, Robert Cribb, Dalton Rosenfield, and Walter Hawkins. We are conducting this oral history via Zoom due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we are interviewing Walter Hawkins. And good afternoon. Kendra, would you ask the first? Hi, my name is Kendra Medina. And our first question today is, what is your current position? What do you do and how did you get there? Well, one, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you all this afternoon and thank you for an opportunity to do this oral interview. Uh, my position with the city of Orlando presently is director of urban development, where I work in the department of economic development. And the division I work in is the downtown development division, as well as the community redevelopment agency, which we call CRA. Uh, I've been with the city of Orlando since 1992, where I serve in the capacity under the leadership of Glenda E. Hood, the mayor of the city of Orlando, uh, as director of urban development, uh, as uh, director of constituent services. And I was responsible for that, working directly with the citizens that are in the community, dealing with any types of uh, inquiries regarding city services 
or better relationships with the mayor's office, also serving the capacity of working with various business business development uh, concerns throughout. And just, I worked in that area almost 11 years. And then later I was moved into another area of the city of Orlando, which was called the Community Affairs Office. And that was responsible for working with the Amway Arena at that time where the Orlando Magic used to play, the Camping World Stadium, and many of the facilities I had oversight responsibility. And then in, in 2003, when Mayor Dyer took office as the mayor, uh, he asked me to come in and work in his present position, as I mentioned to you, Director of Urban Development. And I have the responsibility of working on behalf of the mayor for what he's called our Pathways for Paramore Initiative, which I think that's the focus of our conversation this afternoon. And that is to address four air, five areas of our pathways, uh, pathways for housing, and that is concerned with affordable housing as well as mis mixed use housing in the area, pathways for education, that's looking at our educational system throughout the community, pathways for economic development, that is on business development. Then there's a pathways for public safety, which addresses community concerns regarding code enforcement, uh, any other kind of solid waste issues. And then there's a, a pathways for uh, infrastructure improvement. And that is looking at the infrastructures that we have in the Paramore areas, such as street lighting, uh, other plant materials and other things related to uh, improvements in the area. So those are five areas that I have responsibility along with, I'm responsible for our downtown clean team so the downtown clean team is a department or division that's responsible for the cleanup in the downtown area when people are throughout the area. And that's almost a 24 hours uh, supervision with that area, as well as the downtown information center, which is our uh, facility that provides retail opportunity as well as uh, citizens that have interest in knowing a little bit more about downtown they can go into our facility and we can provide information of that nature. Thank you. Um, Bradley, do you want to ask the next, next question? Yeah. Um, Mr. Hawkins, could you tell us about the role of Jones High School in Paramore and in Black Life in Central Florida? Well, it's an important role, Bradley. I'm glad you asked that question. I have on my beautiful orange shirt on, which is I'm a graduate of Jones High School. And uh, by being uh, Jones High has been an uh, influential school in the area for the long, longest of period of time or, or presently. It's the only African-American school that's in the community. Um, and that has been serving in the capacity of seventh through 12th grade when it was first established. And now it has just ninth grade to, to 12th grade uh, capacity, but it has been one of the key components of an educational uh, sector for the community. Uh, through that effort at Jones High School, you see a sense of pride, not just from academic, but athletics, community uh, pride, as well as just the overall uh, opportunity to come into the area. But like I said, it was the first uh, African-American school in the area uh, that has been just a, a pillar of the one of the components of Jones High School. And many of the students that are living in Paramore President, they look forward to eventually being on the uh, grounds of the school and being a part of that. Uh, it has been a generational thing for the community because many of the people from the, the community from Paramore, they were uh, students of that school and, and their grandchildren or other kids have been uh, related to their cousins. So it's always a family affair when you're talking about the Jones High School Tigers. Thank you. Joshua? <laughs> Um, Mr. Hawkins, could you tell us a little bit about growing up in Paramore? Well, growing up in Paramore is, it, it was how I call it, it was what, what I call it a village. And growing up in Paramore, with that village, there was always uh, involvement with 
the church family, there was involvement with the school family, with community organization. You had truly a business community. Uh, there was not one thing in the community that was not available to the community. So if you go in a village, you can see all the components are there and people enjoyed that kind of relationship. So it, to me, it was a wonderful experience that uh, I cherish for the most part. And and uh, I go back to my roots now. I can see certain people that are uh, families that are still living there. And it's a great feeling, but it's a sense of pride, a sense of community, and a sense of uh, we can do everything, you know, given the right resources and, 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 and an opportunities to go forward. Thank you. Uh, Robert is going to ask the next question, but I think it would be appropriate for him to ask his follow-up question and then his next question. Okay. All right. So it, it sounds like you, you know, with your shirt pride, you know, wearing your high school shirt, you sound very proud of growing up in Paraguay. I'm wondering if that helped lead, lead you to your career choice in urban development. Like, did it inspire you to try and help build this community and it's like it. And that's a great question, Robert. Um, I have always kind of uh, wanted to return to my community. I'm a graduate of Savannah State University in Savannah, Georgia, uh, where I have an under degree, uh, undergraduate degree in sociology and a master's from St. Thomas University, where I have a degree in uh, human resource management and a master's in that area. But one of the things that always was important to me was returning home or returning back to Orlando to give back to a community that gave to me. And I will always saw that as something that I want to do. And there's no other areas that or other parts of the country or the world I want to come back to other than being a part of Orlando. And I'm somewhat, as people say, living the dream. I'm living the dream uh, as I am in the community in the role that I play now with the city of Orlando. So I get to influence, I get to kind of provide some, some uh, sphere of influence as things are being considered. I have a good voice that I can share with people from growing up into, in the neighborhood. And that has always been a plus for me. So Robert, do you want to ask your other question now? Uh, yes. So, how did your experience with other, like, how does your experience compare to other Black communities in Central Florida is, what makes Perry more unique? Well, it goes back to the sense of pride, the sense of community, uh, sense of being a part of a neighborhood growing up. Uh, when you talk about uh, other areas. I'm quite sure they may be similar in, in the areas, uh, but I know my experience has been one that I've, I have felt good about. I've had an opportunity to live down in Liberty City in Miami, as I mentioned to you, going to St. Thomas University. And uh, I can share with you, it wasn't anything uh, better than coming back home to Paramore area to Orlando. And I know Miami offers a lot, but I just felt better when I returned home again. I felt that sense of community, sense of relationship, sense of uh, just involvement. I joined a church that, that I'm still a member of, I, uh, Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church, when I was eight years old, I'm still a member of the same church. So it's still, again, that, that kind of enriched uh, feeling and rich community spirit that was always part of me. So again, I just felt good about all, uh, the area. And you know, share with you guys is that as growing up in the community, we did not call it Paramore. It was no such thing as Paramore. Uh, in that area, uh, in that area, we call it, I lived off of South Street, and we call it South Street. There was other areas of the community, but it's not until uh, Commissioner Knapp Ford, and I believe 1979, 1980, when he tapped the name and the city adopted as Paramore. But before that, it was, you lived either in the Carver Park area, Griffin Park area, just throughout. It was not just that central name of Paramore. 
Thank you. Um, so Dalton is up next and he also has a follow-up question and a question that he had posed uh, from the beginning. So Dalton, you want to ask your questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Hawkins. I, uh, or Hawkins, sorry. I wanted to ask you, um, you've been in your community for a long time. Um, I wanted to ask you what has changed in Paramore um, since the mid 20th century? Uh, what were some of the biggest changes that you've observed? And um, what are some of the changes that you're most proud of? Well, uh, one, of the, one of the most important changes uh, for a period of time, uh, Paramore did not have an elementary school. Um, the elementary school, the, the children, that was because of the inferior product that was in the school. A lot of the kids were having inferior buildings, uh, school books, and all of those things. And the uh, federal government, with the encouragement of citizen uh, input said that we need to do a desegregation order against the, the Orlando area when it comes to the Paramore School. So the two schools that was in Paramore, uh, Holden Street Elementary School as well as Callahan were both closed. And this was part of the process with integration. And when those two schools closed, the kids were bused to six different elementary schools and so, you know, if you're going to six different schools, you're not with your, your uh, playmates in the afternoon. You got various playmates because in school you're with different classmates. So that, that was a, a, a definitely a change with that. So with that particular change, it provided an opportunity to bring on a new school, which we call the Academic Center for Excellence. And that is a pre-K uh, pre through eighth grade school so the kids go to one elementary school now and that has really been a tremendous uh, asset to the community and once you have a good quality schools that means that your uh, opportunities for housing improve because people want to send their children to the best schools in the community and part of that a school and i think you guys are part of it but if you go to the a school uh, and you graduate uh, through eighth grade and you go to Jones High School, you have an opportunity to go to any university in the state of Florida as well as around the country paid by uh, uh, Harris Rosen, uh, which is a very good uh, component. So the, these kids can go to school free of charge. So you guys that had this opportunity free of charge and if they complete going to Jones High School. And then the other thing, if they wanna to go to medical school, then they are given a uh, free um, opportunity to go to med medical school without any cost. So to me, that adds a terrific dynamics to what's going on. Now we're seeing better housing that's going on in the community. There's a new area called Creative Village uh, which has a component of the University of Central Florida, as well as Valencia College, as well as a number of other components. So again, the opportunities are getting better and better as Paramore uh, gets to see itself improve. Thank you. Um, Kendra, I think you have the next question. Uh, okay, so with that in mind about Paramore, what is the direction for Paramore's future? What's the direction? I didn't hear. Uh, the direction for, what is the direction for Paramore's future? Well, the future is, is wide open because it, it provides an opportunity for uh, improvements from housing through recreation, uh, business development, and just to me, it just, a blend of opportunities. How do you uh, control as much as can happen? But one of the things that as a challenge in Paramore, there are a lot of uh, what they call uh, stakeholders that's responsible for a lot of property and they control a lot of the property in the area that can also either incur encourage development or it can discourage development because as a developer, you're looking at an opportunity to 
to build on something, to be able to share it with someone. Hopefully others can see that vision or see that dream that you have and buy into that. Um, so we have a follow-up question from Dalton. If you want to ask your question, it's a good one. Yes, yes ma'am. So I wanted to follow up on, uh, on question six. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you if you, uh, if you have any big ideas for the future and if um, there's anything that you're working on right now that you would like to see done within the near future as well. Well, I have so many big ideas, Dalton, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think Paramore is a bed of opportunities for, for the community. Uh, it has a good blend. It has a good cultural mix, which I think is always important if we could build on that cultural experience. But it also has an opportunity to, for uh, development of improving the housing stock in Paramore. To me, it is second class when it comes to uh, building on that. So if there's an opportunity to come in and build new housing, to me, that provides an opportunity for people to stay in Paramore as well as new residents will want to come and be a part of it when they see that. Because when you drive through the area now, you see some, some areas that you're most concerned about and you would not want anyone to come in. And then there's some areas that has the greatest potential and you get excited about it. So you have a balance of that and then also trying to keep the historical nature of a community. So you have a blend of so many uh, ways that you can see great development opportunities in Paramore. Thank you. Bradley, I think you have the next question. So, how do you plan on combating gentrification to make sure locals of the city aren't displaced? Well, that's always, I wish I had that answer, Bradley. I wouldn't be speaking to you all this afternoon. I'll be on the national circuit. But it, that is one of the hardest things in the world to, how do you, one, you have to define what gentrification is. Uh, some people de define gentrification as trying to move all the you know, African-Americans out you know, and then move all the other people in? Or do you define it, is it based on economics? You know, do you, do you move the businesses that are in Paramore out and you bring in new businesses? You know, you got to look at it from your own, your visual and defining what gentrification. I look at it as an opportunity to blend and mix the, what we have in place bring some new opportunities so that all of us can be uh, blessed in some way because we need better businesses to come in because that's provide some job opportunity. We need better housing that create uh, opportunity for people to improve where they're presently staying, but it also gives someone uh, an area to come into our downtown core, into our Paramore area. Because if you guys look at Paramore, Paramore is only a, uh, uh, three or four blocks from our downtown core. So it's not like Paramore is 20 miles. People sometimes think of Paramore as being 20 miles from our central business district. No, it's not. It's only a couple of blocks away. So it, to me, it offers a, a good mixture, a good blend of how to retain the uh, historical nature, but also provide the, all the other elements so that people can feel good about a community. And Joshua, I believe you have the last question. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. What steps are being taken to ensure that Paramore retains its history as a black community while still making room for the future? Well, I know Dr. Lester is on part of one of our groups that's trying to uh, uh, preserve the history, which is always a challenge when you have a community like that. And I think you guys talked about, talked about it earlier by asking the question of how do you maintain uh, the community? You know, a lot of individuals want to come in. The first thing they may want to do is knock down all of the bad elements in their eyes of housing knock down the buildings. And when you do that, you know, where do your history, is your history gone when you don't have too many 
people that's remaining in the community that can carry that legacy on. And I'm one of those individuals that can carry the le legacy, carry the message as much as I can, and hopefully there's others. So in order to do that, I think you got to make sure there are oral histories or oral interviews like we're having this afternoon. Also being able to put some historical markers in place on some of the sites that uh, that's in place that say, in, in, in 1985, in this particular building, there was a, a drugstore and the owner was such and such, you know, or 1935 or 19 such and such, you know, or a site that's in the area that is no longer there, but maybe putting a marker on that street, uh, recognizing that. Also, I would just say, and we talked about a lot of this, is doing a uh, history walk through Paramore, that it becomes tied into our downtown core. So that when you look at historic downtown, you can also talk about historic Paramore and how all of that blend together. So it'd be a combination of things to me that will best serve the community when it comes to historic preservation. But we still got to go out there and talk with those seniors out there that have lived in that community, walked the community, been a part of the school, to get them to do that history before they go on to you know, another chapter in their life. But it's important to recapture that as much as we can so that when, uh, you know, once you guys get 10 years uh, older, you won't have to talk to Walter, but at least there'll be somebody else out there will carry that message on that there was so much of a rich, uh, rich history in Paramore, and uh, we are definitely uh, starting to lose some of the character, some of the things, because the Paramore is a little, di it looks different than it looked when I was a kid, uh, walking along West Church Street, from the 500 block all the way down to the 1000 block of West Church Street. There were businesses uh, just throughout. And you name it from beauty shops to barber shops to uh, various restaurants. And it was packed, uh, several theaters was on there. You know, uh, one of the theaters I used to go was called the Carver Theater. It was on the corner of West Church Street and Paramore Avenue. If you go there, that building is no longer there. You, you all know what's there now? Orlando City Soccer. The stadium is there. So, you know, again, and when you drive through there, it looks like a big spaceship in Paramore. But that history is no longer there. So those are the things that we need to be able to carry on so that the next generation of uh, or individuals that are moving to the area know that when you – when you uh, live in Paramore, you work in Paramore, it has such a rich history and we welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Are there any other follow-up questions? Um, yeah. I do have one. So in talking about, you know, preserving the history of Paramore, are there any specific projects you have been involved in that is kind of aided in that? Well, we've, like done, we've done the historic marker uh, areas, which has been very good. There is a museum, and Dr. Lester, I believe she has gone to the museum. That's the Wells Built Museum. I would encourage you all to go and, and uh, be a part of that, to see that. And then one other great thing, and this is part of UCF history, there is a new um, building or a room that's dedicated that's on the UCF Valencia uh, campus called the Paramore Room. I don't know if Dr. Lester, if you had a chance to visit there, but I encourage you all to go and check that uh, exhibition out because the history, what I'm sharing with you is on display. And I think that gives you a good characterization of what Paramore uh, was all about during those early years. So again, I wanna commend UCF and, and Valencia for teaming up to, uh, again, make sure that that history is maintained and also what they want to do with that, not only just focus on what has happened in the past, but what's happening in the present and what will be happening in the future so that all of that blends well together. Okay, then. Thank you very much. And 
And do you have something that you want to say that we didn't ask you? <laughs> no, not really. I I just applaud you you all for your interest. Hope that one day that you will consider uh, living in Paramore. So don't throw that out or being a business owner in Paramore, being an educator in Paramore, being a preacher in Paramore, being an attorney in Paramore. All those opportunities are out there. I would just encourage you all to consider um, being able to look at what's available and how you can make a difference. And as you all talked about the rich history, it's important that we have faces like you all that continue to push the envelope and say, Paramore is not a lost community, it's a live community, it's doing well, and I wanna be a part of the future. So you guys represent the future of Paramore, and I would just encourage you to be active, be strong about it, and, and let them know that they do have a, an advocate at uh, former Jones High School, Walter Hawkins, that's doing his part to keep that presence there. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Hawkins, for your, um, for your oral history, and um, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. All right, great. Thank you all for this opportunity and look forward to hearing from you. I know I'll see Dr. Lester in the future because we're on two or three other committees, so, but I, I enjoyed this opportunity. So you guys take care of yourself. Wish you the best, stay safe and uh, go all night so that you all can be great uh, influencers in this community or what other community you may choose to live in in the future. Thank you.